and we will formally begin. So once again, everyone, welcome to the AMATIC 2020 webinar series. Our webinar for today, Tips and Strategies for the Virtual Shift of Face-to-Face -face Math Classes with Fred Felden and Paul Nolting. Uh, this is co-sponsored by AMATIC and NOS. Uh, the views expressed by the presenter are not necessarily the views of AMATIC. Uh, that dinging you're here is probably people trying to get into the webinar, so I will check that in a minute and then turn it off. <laughs> um, commercial products mentioned are not endorsed by AMATIC. Uh, McGraw-Hill is the sponsor for the 2020 AMATIC webinar series. And now I will stop my sharing. And Fred, if you're ready, we can go ahead and start, uh, start your sharing and begin the webinar. All right, I'll share in just a second. Paul, Paul and I are gonna do a three sentence introduction of ourselves. I'm a professor of math at Coastline College in Southern California. I've been there 25 years. I pioneered online teaching for us in 1999 and love it. I've been doing it ever since. My interests are music, beer, active learning, <laughs> technology, social media, and higher education in no particular order. And I, I'm so grateful you're here. Paul, you wanna introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Paul Nolting, and again, thank you for coming. Um, I've done a lot of work with colleges and helped them become more successful, especially looking at students who have failed. I have uh, pretty much figured out how to help students become successful until these online issues came up, and now that's why we got Fred to help us out. Worked with about 100 colleges or so on consulting, uh, written a few books, uh, did a lot of presentations, and what I'm really noted for is, is figuring out how to help students in colleges become more successful themselves, especially mathematics. And then I do work with a lot of students with disabilities because I found out that some of them had difficulty in math. They did everything we suggested and that work didn't work out. Then several years ago, I started the math, National Math Summits, which I'll talk about some more. But we're just delighted you're here. Every once in a while, you'll see Fred and I looking down that's either looking at the keyboard to move forward or uh, some information we have. But this, this, this is gonna be great. This is gonna be great. We want your input too. So that's more than three sentences, I'm done. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna share my screen for the first part of the webinar and then I'll stop sharing and Paul will take over. So, do you all see the first slide, the title slide now for our webinar? Give me a thumbs up, Paul, if you can see our title slide. All right. You got it. All right, Paul and I have already introduced ourselves. There's some contact info. And like Paul said, we thank you very much for giving up your day to be with us here from home. Staying at home, dude. That's funny. It's good enough for Superman. It's good for us, isn't it? <laughs> so Paul's going to say a few words of introduction about the content he'll cover, and then I'll take over in a minute. Paul, you're up. Okay. And Fred and I are going to be back, I mean, talking back and forth, so don't think that this is unusual. This is what we do. So anyway, <laughs> uh, again, I'd like to thank you. Uh, this is also helped by the, the math, uh, National Math Summit, Planning Committee, and in fact, we're gonna be doing the fourth National Mass Summit this coming uh, fall, I mean, this coming spring with the MATIC, I mean, with NOS, I should say, and MATIC themselves. Uh, that actually looks like the Planning Committee. We wanna make sure people are noted that Annette Cook's gonna be working with us, myself, Julie Phelps, and, and Nancy Salter. Also, the Steering Committee, this is how we get people to help out. We're gonna have people from NOS, of course, and people from the other areas. Um, now, what's coming up next is the next webinars. When we're looking at the June one, it's going to be basically student ownership in a pandemic area, I should say. This is going to be sponsored by AMATIC and Standards Committee, I should say. Then we're going to look at uh, equity. This is going to be a big one. Gene Carpenter is going to do this, again, sponsored by AMATIC and NOS. Uh, and then the next one is going to be looking at standards, and that's sponsored by Amatic. Uh, Julie Phelps is doing a lot of them. So 
anyway, you're getting the picture. We're, we're trying to help you become more successful now. That's why we started doing these webinars. We didn't want to wait to the National Mass Summit or to the next um, Amana conference. We basically said, hey, just do it now. Quick workshop agenda. Uh, National Mass Summits, we talked about that. You can see the dates. You can now already start registering. We will have it. There's no doubt about that. Uh, supporting organizations. Without them, we couldn't do the summit. And the whole point is to get everybody together to help everybody at the same time. That was our philosophy and idea. We can talk I, about I think I'll move on rather than have you read every bullet. Is that yeah, okay? that's okay. Research, okay. and we can look at study skills, and then Fred's going to take over, and then I'll take over at the end. Now, this is you the variable chart, okay? And what happens here is, look, you got about, you know, 34 to 50% is cognitive interest skills, and not that much anymore for some colleges because they don't have placement. Next one is like 41% to 25% effective, and Fred's going to talk about 25%. Okay, <laughs> we're going to do a little bit of research because this is important to the fact that you have to convince your faculty and the administrators. Here it is. This is the most recent one on online available mathematics. What does it say? Recommendations. Structured design. Frequent communication. That's what we're doing. Uh, instructions on self-directed learning support. That's it. Next one, we start looking at uh, grades, variance. 41% of the variance of the grades basically is affective characteristics. Again, if you start looking at self-efficacy, that's the same thing that worked out and self-efficacy is about 35% before. And if you start looking about academic coaching, we're gonna talk about that, it's important. And here's the last one. This is the one that really gets us now, okay? This is it. Students indicate that 71% of interference into college success was mathematics. Got that? With mathematics, strategic learning and economics. This is what you show your administrators. We wanna get you more money and more support. And this is it. Okay, next one. I think that's going to be you, Fred. That's it. Paul, I think some of those slides he'll be repeating in his part of the presentation and go into more detail. Yeah, I can do some more later. Yeah. So um, these are really uncertain times right now. And as a department chair, I hear from both faculty and students who were suddenly thrust into a method of teaching and a mode of learning that they didn't sign up for, they had no experience in, they had no desire to participate in. Uh, it, it's, it's, a very, it's a very tough time, especially for families. I think this says it all. <laughs> if you've got a family, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I often hear from students things like, I live at home with my parents, they both lost their job, uh, I, I've got a baby, I'm the sole income earner in my family. I'm so stressed out, I don't know what to do. Uh, another student, uh, I lost my job and I lost my housing because housing was contingent upon my employment. And I mean, it, 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 these are incredibly tough times. And what I'm, I'm not saying I'm an expert on how to deal with remote teaching and learning and, and a pandemic, but I'm hoping that I can give you some ideas, some food for thought, to get your brain working, to think outside the box. I mean, whoever thought, for example, that a tennis court could be contained in a three foot wide patio. People are doing very creative things right now. Who would have thought you could be playing tennis with the inclined plane of a wheelbarrow as your opponent? <laughs> I, on one way, you can look at this as an opportunity to be super creative, to think outside the box. Uh, if, if I had to say, three or four focus topics, they might be the following. Uh, keep your class on schedule. Um, I know it's tempting to slow down, but then you might end up speeding through your syllabus at the end. You know, just whatever your syllabus and schedule was in the beginning, maintain that. Uh, number two, uh, reach out to your students proactively who might be falling behind or not passing your class class. Um, I've certainly saved a, a large number of students myself, one of whom said, for example, her family's in New York. She can't see them. Uh, yeah, she has a job and she's working from home, but she, she couldn't overcome her depression and she just dropped out. Um, I sent her a quick email, you know, we missed you. Uh, if you're interested in catching up, 
we can work that out. And she got back in touch with me and she's now participating in the class and on target to earn a B. Um, I also have talked to professors who say, oh my God, I now have to take all the lectures I gave in class and record them. No, you don't. You shouldn't drain your energy and resources by recreating or re-recording all your lectures. There's plenty of uh, textbook authors and internet superstars out there who have already done that for you. Here's just a few. <clears throat> Remember, it's not so much what you do that counts, it's what the students do. So don't be obsessed with creating the perfect lecture or, or stockpiling videos of yourself. It's just your job instead is to inspire students uh, and motivate them and highlight and summarize. Do communicate. As a department chair, if there's one specific uh, cause of emails to me and our dean, it's a lack of communication. I emailed my instructor and I haven't heard from them for two weeks is, is fairly typical. Even if you don't have a plan in place or an answer to their question, acknowledge the email, respond to it, uh, make your course involve a humane learning experience. And even though that's your number four priority, that's probably most important. I was thinking last night, maybe I should move this ahead in the presentation. Maybe this should be your number one priority. Don't worry so much about content because content is ubiquitous. Don't so, so much worry about which software and equipment and uh, I'm gonna use, but instead focus on creating meaningful and humane learning experiences. Uh, that was a quote from a recent article, uh, which I provided a link for you. Uh, for those of you who might be concerned about the federal government, which we were at our particular school, we were actually audited by the Federal Department of Ed, uh, who examined some of our online courses and found regular and substantive interaction missing and was ready to categorize them as a correspondence course, which doesn't receive financial aid. So they were threatening us to return millions of dollars. Uh, we've since responded to that and raised our level of instruction and our, <clears throat> our regular and effective content uh, regular and effective contact with all our instructors now, but people are worried who are new to online and remote teaching that we're going to get busted. And the federal government announced that, don't worry, if you can use traditional means of contact, including chat and emails, uh, we'll count that. I, I think the federal government is going to give us some slack. So what tools do we use? As math professors, our discipline has a very unique problem and that's the notation. You just, you can't type math on a keyboard. Uh, many, many years ago, I bought myself a tablet PC and I write with a stylus. <clears throat> in, instead of trying to move my mouse around, which ends up looking like kindergarten writing, doesn't it? So find some way to digitize your handwriting. Uh, here are four different methods that I show on the screen right now. If you don't have a fancy tablet PC, perhaps you've got an iPad. Well, if you'll click the link, there's a three minute video there on how to hook up your iPad and uh, project that into a Zoom conference or into a, re to a class. Uh, another option is just a document camera. Just hold your paper under it and write with pen and hook that up to your, to your screen. But uh, definitely our notation provides a challenge that's not there for many other disciplines. On the student end, how can they show your work? Well, my course management system uh, has a show work feature. So in my math lab, when I create an assessment, I can enable and in fact require the show work feature and that has a nice math palette. I've created a six minute video instructing students how to open up that feature and how to use it. It takes some practice, 
Um, I also have students show me their work by using a mobile scanning app on their cell phone. And I've created a video on that. There's a link to it on this particular slide as well. You want, definitely want screen capture software. My program of choice is Snagit. Uh, I think it's about $40, but I use it every day. Here are just a few examples. I mean, you just can't do this on a keyboard or with a mouse. In fact, <clears throat> God, I don't know, probably 10 years ago, I stopped using the whiteboard. I brought in my tablet PC and project that onto the screen. All right, another hot tip is to include the affective domain, which is feelings, emotions, attitude, and behavior. You will get pushback from professors who say that's not their job, but I think uh, the general consensus now realizes how important that is. Every time I meet with students, every single time, I pay special attention for some amount during class to the effective domain. I even give them the scientific research that shows if you can communicate with people, uh, uh, it, it, it creates a, uh, a, a desire to succeed that may not otherwise be there. If you can explain something to someone else, that's the best way to learn it. And maybe to convince professors to allow their students to communicate with each other. You can include this quote from Michelle Kakansky Brock. And if you don't follow Michelle, you're missing out on one of the most amazing mentors that we as math professors could ever take advantage of. I also like to include non-routine questions. I have a lot of sources of those. I've collected hundreds of these over the years. This particular slide is probably too small for you to read, but I've got a website that you can click on to access it, <clears throat> or of course access it from the recording of this presentation. And then finally, my best tip is to include synchronous activities. I, I never really used to until just the last two or three years, but uh, I think that the technology is robust enough now to actually replicate the act of learning that we can all do in face-to-face -face classes, finally, for the first time. Otherwise, if everything is synchronous, students probably are frustrated, the, the feeling of isolation is overwhelming, you definitely want to include uh, synchronous activities, and I'll talk about that for the next few minutes. Uh, it's a little controversial. Fred, you can hold on. Have yeah. you can hold on for just a moment. We do have a couple of relevant questions in the chat before you yeah. go on to the students. Um, do you know your student's preference? Is it to show the work in my lab's math or is it scanning their paper and pencil work? Probably the latter. They're so comfortable with paper and pencil work, and it's pretty easy to create a multi-page PDF file and email that to your instructor. Mm -hmm. But I will tell you why I created assessments. I've done everything. I, well, I've done three major methods of assessments, and we'll talk about that more at the end. But in my math lab, I am able to create an assessment with infinite variation, scramble the question order, and show work required. So every student gets an individual assessment. And that was my motivation for trying to use my math lab. So I recommend trying it. <clears throat> Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for stopping me anytime. But I was, I was about to say about uh, a little bit about the controversy of turning your webcams on. I don't know if you follow me on Twitter, but two or three weeks ago, there was a, maybe a two or three day war going on about asking students to turn their webcams on uh, because how, of how invasive it is. And there's even a psychological uh, disability uh, where seeing yourself uh, is, is, uh, creates, is a disturbing image. <laughs> so 
I, you know, I even said, hey, do, you know, did we make students wear bags over their heads when they enter the classroom? And the response was, duh, do you make students strap a mirror to their forehead when they walk into the classroom? I mean, it got heated. <laughs> But I, I asked students, and I have for three years, ever since I've been doing synchronous webinars, please turn your webcams on. It, it, it means for engagement. It means, for example, when I asked Paul if he could see something, you know, give me a thumbs up. Because, I mean, right here, you're looking at the screen, you're looking at 50 students. Uh, it, it's very similar to standing up in front of the classroom and looking at your students. So I do ask for students to turn their webcams on. Uh, Here's a humorous anecdote. At, at, at one point, <clears throat> a student was just showing her ceiling and I asked her if she could you know, rotate her camera down and, and, and there was no response. And I, and I called out her name and I said, can you hear me? And way up at the top, she gave me a thumbs up and I said, oh, we're, are you just having a bad hair day? And she said, yes. <laughs> so you can make individual exceptions. You know, if the student doesn't want to show their their camera, uh, their face on camera, you know, I'll make an exception, don't worry. If you don't want, uh, if a student doesn't want to show you their house or their room, you create a virtual background. So there's ways around it. But uh, here might be the protest you get from professors who say, yeah, this is an online course. <clears throat> I do everything asynchronously. I've tried having online office hours and nobody shows up. So here's all the bullet points from all the professors I've heard uh, of everybody who has tried synchronous activities in their online courses. I'll try and address some of these. What I do is divide class time up into thirds. For the first third, there might be an icebreaker, a chat, so some, show some humanity. How are you doing? How's your family? How's your health? Uh, maybe include an affective domain topic, and it doesn't have to be a big one. Here's some examples. Just show them a meme. Just show them a graphic image and ask them to type in the chat box to respond to it, to comment on it. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. Just show the students that you understand and you empathize. I've even got a nice bullet list of 25 plus quick questions and discussion prompts. Then the meat of the class will be the content. Uh, I don't try to cover everything. I, you know, I tell them I can't. Hey, we meet for one hour a week. I can't cover a four-unit class, but what I will do is summarize and highlight and motivate. And I know after teaching college algebra you know, for 25 years, I know the topics and concepts you struggle with, and I'm focused on those. At the same time, you don't want to spend your time lecturing. You want some interactive student participation. You can use, believe it or not, you can use the same active learning strategies that you use in the classroom, as I mentioned, because finally the technology is robust enough. If you haven't used breakout groups, that should be at the top of your list to try at your next class. It's a learning curve. <clears throat> I'll give you an example. If you're sharing your screen and you break the class up into groups, that screen sharing goes away. So I learned very quickly my first breakout group when I asked students to solve a problem and I came back and brought everyone afterwards five minutes later for a whole class discussion. They said, Professor Feldman, the problem went away. We, didn't, we don't know what it was. <laughs> so you'll learn uh, other ways to handle breakout groups. Have them take a picture of it with their cell phone or post it into the chat file. Um, and the way for students to share their work, and I'll, I'll talk more about this throughout the webinar, is to have students, everyone should have a Sharpie. You take it, you take it, take the Sharpie, And have them hold, you know, hold it up to their webcam. And even if they have a funky old low resolution webcam, everyone can see it. But if you use a regular pen or pencil, it just won't be visible. 
So tell your students to arm themselves with a supply of Sharpies for the semester. You know what this is like? Mitchell Alves is a professor at our college and I know he's attending this webinar. I saw him sign in. Uh, a few years ago, he asked for a supply of portable classroom whiteboards. So he hands those out to every student with, with uh, whiteboard markers and they're all working at their individual seats and they hold up their whiteboards so he can see their progress and understanding. So that's what this is like. There are ways to do active learning, classroom teaching, and a synchronous online webinar. There, here's some more uh, hot tips for you to use. I learned uh, the, the third bullet from Maria Anderson, who says she often gives a prompt and asks students to type something into the chat file, but wait for her signal to hit enter so they don't copy each other. And then when you give them the signal, the chat box starts to fill up with their responses. Very cool. You can't easily do that in the classroom. So there are some advantages to online and remote teaching and learning. And then I've got some closing remarks uh, that can take place the last few minutes of your class. <clears throat> I've had pretty good luck. I've been averaging about 80% attendance. And one of the things that helped was I convinced our VP of instruction to allow me to list the synchronous component of the online class in the schedule. So when students sign up for College Algebra with Support, which is an online class, they know that every Wednesday night from 7.30 to 8.30, they're going to be meeting with me online. If they miss the live recording, they can write a summary of what was discussed after they watch the recording. If you want to see an example of one of my webinars, there's a link. Uh, making a video doesn't have to require fancy equipment. Personally, I use uh, Camtasia and my tablet PC with digital ink and all kinds of high-tech innovations, but you can easily create a video with your cell phone. The important thing is to personalize your course. Uh, as soon as I began implementing synchronous activities, my success and retention almost tripled. So I highly recommend you. You got to do this, guys. And I know not everyone does. Um, I spoke about uh, teaching support classes online under AB705 at a conference in Sacramento earlier this year in January, or was it February? There were 40 attendees in the room, and I asked, is anyone doing breakout groups? And only one person raised their hand. It's kind of like, you know, how comfortable we all are as classroom professors behind the podium, and yet you've got to take the courage to step out away from the podium, wander around the classroom, visit students individually, even sit down in your seat while a student goes up to the whiteboard and teaches and explains something. Breakout groups are similar. <clears throat> uh, having an online class where you pose a problem, tell the students you're going to be in breakout groups, or if it's a small group like five or ten students, I'll sometimes say you guys can talk to, see, and hear each other, and I want you to talk and help each other. I'm leaving the room. I'll be back in five minutes. Good luck. I'm going to go to the kitchen and have a glass of wine and visit with my wife. <laughs> That's so the way you teach online. <laughs> really, you can't, you can't, as a professor, for you to be on camera, you know, one hour or 90 minutes nonstop is emotionally draining. You've been there, I know that. Give yourself a break every few minutes. Uh, I'll let, the teach, let, let the students do a little peer, peer teaching. <laughs> All right, I promise Fred? at the end we talk, yeah. Before you move on, we have a couple questions about these videos. Sure. Um, one is a question of, do students have any issues with you recording them in the sessions? So do you record your synchronous sessions? Because uh, Linda Blanco was uh, saying some of the students had their cameras off because it was being recorded. And um, I believe you answered the question about requiring students to attend the sessions. If they miss the recorded session, you let them submit something afterwards. Is that correct? Correct. That was a condition 
on offering synchronous components that the vice president made me. Well, I guess he said, you have to have some way to make up the activity if they miss the live webinar. I guess there are other options you could do, but I chose to have them watch the recording. <clears throat> I do discuss the fact that the class is being recorded up front with everyone. I let them know, you know, people who show up early, we chit chat casually and I tell them, okay, I'm gonna start class. I'll hit the record button so they know in advance it's coming. I've never had a problem. Um, you know, I, 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 um, I'll tell you what I've had more of a problem with, and that's proctoring assessments. I don't know if you've ever used electronic surveillance software, but it is totally invasive. It records your webcam, your screen, your, your uh, internet access. Um, I've had more problems with electronic proctoring of exams. Um, I've been giving uh, webinars, Zoom webinars now for two years in a row, and I've never had a, a problem with recording and webcam usage. But you know, it all, all it takes is one student to... But on the other hand, like I said earlier, you make an allowance. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not inflexible. If someone tells me I just, I'm not comfortable with my webcam on, I would absolutely make, no one's done that yet other than the one student for one class who had a bad hair day. <laughs> you, so I hope that answers the question. What yeah. do you think? There are some other technical questions, but I'll save those to the end. So for those of you who are typing in questions, I'm trying to take note. And um, yeah, I'm sure we can get you these slides and uh, we'll work on getting you the, the correct link to Fred's sources. Okay, Fred, thanks. Sure, all right, my last topic covers assessment. For us at Coastline, we've been teaching online, like I said, since 1999. We're very, uh, <clears throat> very creative and experienced and knowledgeable about it. The hardest part for us was we had required midterms and finals to be paper and pencil, show your work proctored by a human, and that was no longer possible. Mm -hmm. So we had to make the transition <coughs> to electronic administration of exams and collection of uh, assessments. And uh, there's, I just wanna emphasize, this is a big slide with a lot of small print, that between me alone, I've tried three different techniques. I've had Zoom meetings where they turn their webcam and audio on, and they can ask questions of me in the chat file, and I watch them as if I was in the same room with them. So it replicates the in-person proctoring that I would normally do with my students. I've also given them, given them a My Math Lab test with infinite variation and scramble the question order and show work required. I post it and they have 24 hours to, re to, to return it to me. <clears throat> I've also given them you know, a three hour deadline to return there. I've tried so many different things and we have so many instructors in the department who are experimenting with importing tests from Microsoft Word, uh, MyOpenMath and TestGen, et cetera, into Canvas. Uh, but those are all static questions that don't change, but gosh, there's so many things you can do. Uh, you've got to get together and talk to each other and decide what works for you, what you might try, what's everyone else doing. Don't try and do this in isolation. There's no one right answer. Uh, there's, you know, try a variety of, of things. Experiment. Like I said at the very beginning of my part of the talk, try thinking outside the box. Um, here's an example of a couple of my personal mentors who totally think outside the box. And my one regret is that I've never been brave enough to try some of their ideas, like asking questions such as Francis Sue suggests at the top of your screen. And I think we're towards the end here. I think my last, here's my, my last slide. Um, of all my topics I've discovered, I think here's my big takeaway. There's a lot of professors who say, I, I don't have time to cover everything. Uh, I say, you, you, you do need to maintain rigor and cover content. 
Uh, the second item, don't drain your energy, trying to create unique content for you and your classes and your students. Use what's out there. There are plenty of excellent professors and internet superstars with content you can use. On the other hand, <clears throat> follow the 80-20 rule, which means spend 80% of your time proactively reaching out to the 20% of the students who need, need it the most. Uh, I, I think everything else I've, I've talked about, uh, I guess this would be my big summary. Fred Feldman's personal tips for success <laughs> on teaching math remotely. Okay, uh, I took about 30 minutes. Uh, I appreciate that. And uh, Jennifer, thanks for interrupting with questions. And uh, I hope we'll have time at the end to address more of them. Unless there's any burning question we should desire, we'll turn it over to Paul. What do you guys think? Should I stop sharing? Paul, you're ready to take over? Yeah, I'm ready to click. Okay, I'm going to stop share. Okay. Okay, oh, I should be up. Fred, can you see it? I do. You're good. You're off and running. Okay, that's what you do. That's how we communicate. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you, Fred. A lot of things you talked about are great. I mean, a couple of them I knew. A lot of them I did not know. And <clears throat> if you started looking at that first part of that research, it said develop a structure. Well, you did that. You gave them a structure on how to be successful. Okay. Next one said, communicate, communicate, and boy, you talked about communicating in all different ways. And the communication is not just for the students themselves from you to me, or you to him, them to, them to, or you to them, it's within each other. When we start looking at the self-efficacy and the motivational aspects that works, and of course, the faculty development we're doing right now, um, so what we're looking at is how to become more successful helping students through a variety of ways. Some of the other research we talked about, uh, Julie Phelps and Linda Zintek did a lot of this. But again, I'm just going to show you this for at least 15 seconds. You ready? And print this in your mind. What we did was already talked about quality of instruction, which Fred did an excellent, excellent, had excellent ideas and did an excellent job. Now we're going to start looking at motivational aspects, study skills, anxiety. Notice that that's up to 25 to 41%. And later on, you can go back to those articles and go get them. Uh, the self-directed learning there from what we talked about earlier. So this kind of shift in your mind. Right now, people are saying, I can't do this. I go, well, yeah, you can. Fred already gave you some ideas on how to do this. A lot of these things are just sharing the information and talking to them. So I'm going to go through some things. Uh, and then we'll have some questions at the end. And what we're looking at for now is, um, let's see here, that should be the page down. Yep, I'll just do this way. Yep, there we go. Uh, first thing I usually do is I give them the math study skills evaluation. This is free, this is free. Should I say it one more time? <laughs> it's free. And there's no math, no math. One more time, there's no math. You know, Fred did the math stuff. Now I'm doing the more the affective study skills strategies and techniques. And you can see it's free and I got my uh, website up there. You go to it, you click on it. You can do it, your students can do it. But this is what happens. This is very powerful. And I picked myself for the first one. Uh, it's 35 questions. They can do it at home. You can assign it, that's what we do. And you can see what happened. I failed, oh my goodness, I failed math study skills. Whoa. Uh, that's great. And some of you are going, unless you heard me talk before, what do you mean that's great? Well, the idea is that if you fail the math study skills assessment, that means you're not doing some study skills strategies that are correlated with academic success. And it's really not your fault. And I tell them, instead of a 69, hey, you, you should have made a 35. That's about the lowest you can make on this thing. Because now we know some areas to help you. And a couple of the areas are, you know, study effectively. Now we're getting into study schedules, study places, study tools. Uh, Fred talked about a lot of that stuff. Because you can take the same thing he talked about the, the faculty and put it with the students. Next one, memory and learning. The learning process, I mean process, the preferences. 
He talked about students getting together and talking. Oh my goodness, that's auditory. Oh, that's auditory. That's what a lot of people miss online. They do it all visual and, and you'll get most of the people, but not all of them. So, and then the learning process of how you learn. Next one, the homework and reading. Reading, well, most people never read anyway, but the idea is that we can have some ideas of reading and the homework. I'm really gonna hit kind of hard on how you do homework online and show it. Other one is the listening and note-taking. You know, how do you do note-taking online? I can show you that too. But these scores are low and that's great. And the last one, of course, they're freaking out on tests. And Fred had a good idea about how to take the test. In fact, the last, one of the last calls I got from California, they called up and I never mentioned schools. They said, no, Dr. Nolte, we want you to come in. We have some issues with test anxiety. I said, okay, I can come in. We can do some strategies with your students. They said, oh, no, no, no. It's not with the students. This is with the faculty. They're freaking out. They don't know how to do this online stuff. Well, if you're any of those people, now you do, because Fred talked about it. So after each question, I give you information. So this first one basically, seldom study maths every school day. I'll tell you why you should do it, give you some suggestions and refer to pages in the uh, internet math text. So these are sample questions. Uh, let me go back here. When I learn math, sometimes believe, we got them believe that anxiety and test anxiety and affect the characteristics are part of their grade. Once they believe that, it gives them hope because what happens now by scoring low on the math study skills evaluation, we're gonna blame that. Not your intellectual ability, not that you don't have the math gene, you got that? We just didn't teach you how to study and learn and that's our fault, our fault. And we're gonna do this now. So they go, oh, there's hope. I said, well, yes, there's hope because we can change your study behaviors and give you a good instruction like Fred talked about. Uh, anxious, I, I got a question on that. Of course they get anxious. I mean, and we'll teach them strategies, which I'll go over. Next one, study. How much do they actually study? Oh, this is, this is easy. Not much, <laughs> okay? Uh, and so I'm talking eight to 12 hours a week. Of course, I hope they study six, but the idea that will tell them some information about this. And the last one is homework. They don't do a homework system, and we'll get into that. And doing tests, they don't check it over. So these are some of the ideas. So what happens, I'm showing them specific behaviors to help them become more successful. And even given the survey, and I, I sent this out to, you know, almost like a thousand people one time when they, they were calling me. Uh, doing the survey is free. You can put it in your class. These suggestions give them an idea, oh, this. And what I find out also in the survey, they don't lie. If I'm talking to them in person, sometimes they don't tell me the truth. Okay, that sort of thing. Okay, anxiety, whoa. Um, <clears throat> some of you have heard me talk about anxiety issues. It's here, it's real. You know, it, it's just unreal. And what I found out from my research, <clears throat> excuse me, I got some allergies, is that it started in third grade. Ask your students, they don't mind talking about anxiety. And the idea is that we got to believe it, we got to give strategies and techniques actually for online. And there's ways to do that too. And the, the couple of them, tensing, relaxing exercises, we're going to go through that real quick. Deep breathing, okay, visual imagery, daydreaming, that's okay. Longitude control, then positive self talk. So hang on to your hats. Well, we don't wear hats. Hang on to your mask. Well, we shouldn't say that. You're probably not wearing a mask now. But anyway, you do these in the class. Now, what Fred was saying was true. If you talk for a while, if you do 30 minutes and no have inter any interactions, you're gone. We know the learning style is set up where people will pay more attention if they're visual, but if they're auditory, they're, they're off the nowhere land. So what happens with this one here on tense and relaxing, you can do it right now. Put your feet flat on the floor, put your hands underneath your chair, and for about five seconds, you're gonna pull down and tense up. Pull down, tense up. Pull down, tense up. I'm doing it too. Okay, Fred, do it. This is what I do. Pull down, tense up. Pull down, tense up. This looks kind of weird, okay? But I have them do it. And if you do it online, you have everybody up there and you can do exactly what I did. I call somebody out and go, come on, let's try this. And the idea here is that this is a relaxation tech that can work. So even before doing online tests, you may say, okay, do some of your relaxation techniques. If you want to, you got a couple minutes. Okay, that's one. Next one, 
is the, is the deep breathing. You've already heard about this one. It's inhale through your nose, exhale through your mouth. You know, inhale, exhale. I have them practice this during different type of sessions. It takes two or three minutes to practice this. Some people are going, oh, I don't want to do this. It makes you look foolish. I go, well, you're going to do it because I'm watching you. And you may need it during the test. And what I don't tell, well, I do tell them this. I said, look, you need a break. We've been talking for half an hour. We got to do something to break up that monotony. We got to do something to get your learning curve up there. Because as you know, what happens, learning goes up and after a while it goes this way. So it goes up and before it goes this way, we do a little exercise. Fred has ones, I have relaxation ones, it works. So that works too. So deep breathing, just don't go. <laughs> Don't hyperventilate, tell them not to hyperventilate, not a good thing, you know, where's the bag, throw your mouth, okay, you got that one. Visual imagery, hey, that's just neat. We all do this, you all have a happy place to go to. I mean, honestly, when I talk to people about this, I used to think, well, they don't have one. And then I ask hundreds of people, do you have a happy place? They go, yeah, yeah, I got one. I go, don't tell me what it is. I have a few people who told me they're happy places. Um, some of it was R-rated, okay, and some of it was really bizarre. So I said, <clears throat> whatever you do, close your eyes, imagine yourself there. So for five seconds now, we're closing your eyes, five seconds, imagine yourself wherever you're going to be. Okay, that's good enough. I usually do it for 15 or so. If you see in color, that means more you're a visual learner. If you see nothing, that could be your, an auditory learner. <clears throat> but the idea is have them practice that, practice that. Because you want to have them practice that and do it during the test. The palming technique <clears throat> is the next one. This is the one who you, nobody wants to talk to you. So you actually put your hands up here on the desk and palm. Probably not as appropriate for here with online, but it does work in the classroom, but it knocks everything out. So these are some short-term techniques. You actually have them practice. And actually, I put test questions on. Which relaxation technique are you going to use? Write it out. And I tell them ahead of time, because I want them to practice. Next one, the mindfulness. OK. That's a whole big deal now with mindfulness. Here's a quick, dirty thing of mindfulness. You've got to be in the present. In the present, taking the test. In the present, during the, the, eggs, the synchronous video uh, lectures. If you're thinking about the past, got that, the past, you get depressed. You think about the future, you get anxious. Now, here and now, that's it. And then the mindset, growth and fixed, that's right. And then the cognitive one, this is another one. What do they tell themselves during the test? What do they actually tell themselves during our lectures? You know, I can't get this. And I said, positive talk. I want you to write down five positive statements. And I actually tell them five positive statements. <clears throat> and then I want you to hold them up and show me. What are they? And, and I have everybody show them up. Sometimes they share them. So that's good because that idea is that cognitive part because most students, what happens after missing three or four questions, bingo. They're going, I'm going to fail, I'm going to fail, I'm going to fail. So that's part of the anxiety thing that you can deal with. And that is very important because what some of the articles are talking about, anxiety is killing STEM, and anxiety is killing memory and learning. Okay, I'm not gonna go this much detail. This is like one of Fred's slides, a lot of stuff on there, but the idea is an overall system. We're gonna talk about a few more of these and move on. Um, you gotta look at note-taking, you gotta look at note-taking with a system. You gotta look at tutoring, and what we found out with online courses, number one problem we found, Time management, organization and procrastination was the number one predictor of failure. Got that? Failure. So we got to talk about that and then the apps. <clears throat> chat rooms. He talked about chat rooms. I'm going to talk about it for at least three, four more seconds. I set up chat rooms individually for students. I'm not even there. I tell them to do group work. Remember we said group work, go home, go to the library, work together? That's fine with me. Set it up. We'll get to that in a minute. So, and then tutor strategies. Uh, materials and reading online textbooks. Nobody does the 10 steps. Highlight, do some things, that's good. Take notes from reading, take notes from reading. Nobody does the 10, I show them the 10, I tell them to do five, they get back with me. 
<clears throat> they show me the five steps. I'm not going to go through that much more. Uh, time management, again, remember I said number one issue, smartphones, put the information in there. And what is the best time to study math? Right after synchronous or asynchronous lectures, right after it, staging your long-term memory better. It works, it works, it works. Homework, do it now. Right after lecture, do it now. Then we'd already talked about this. You know, study areas, Zoom, Skype, FaceTime, whatever you want to do. Have them do their own. Have them actually set up groups during the lecture and then tell them what to do. And if you want to be more creative, have a group later report back every once in a while during your class time. Okay, speeding up a little bit. Online homework. Oh my goodness. I got to take a sip after this one. Boy. All right, about five minutes. Okay, <clears throat> that sounds good. Online homework. Um, here's the question. After they do the online homework, what do they have, physically have? Uh, answer is nothing. That's what I see, nothing. What do you review for, for your test? Nothing. Now there are exceptions. Here's the rule. Maybe you see the click twice. So click twice. Then here's the system. Here we go. After you click twice, and this is right out of my math lab, since somebody already mentioned it. Click twice. Example problems, I'm pointing right in there, write it. Keywords right in there. Over here, explanations right in there. You do it after clicking twice, okay? That works. In fact, I asked them to have them hold it up. Show me what the homework is. So that's an online homework one. Test taking steps. This is interesting. I had them make up, um, uh, cheat sheets. Now I really freak you out. Uh, you can't use them on the test. I may have to modify that a little bit because what Fred was saying is, you know, how do we modify this? Or I can say memory data dump or whatever you want. I had to make up things they can memorize so as soon as they the test, they write it down. They can write it down, write it down, write it down. And then they go through the steps. The question you should have with your students, and again, they don't do the 10 steps, is this one. Can we review questions? Next one, success plan. I'll do this in one minute. Um, they need a success plan. That's part of your plan. You know, information, what are we gonna do? What course, what grades I want? What are my goals? You can see all that right there. Next one, study strategies from the math study skills evaluation and other things Fred talked about. What study strategies I'm gonna use? Write it in there, motivational strategies, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. <clears throat> Pretty quick, but you can see what I'm doing. If they make a plan, they stick to it more likely, and you can monitor the plans. Next one, here you go, tutoring. We're gonna spend the last 30 seconds or a minute on this one. Uh, this becomes interesting. Like I said earlier, I did a, a workshop with somebody, was, uh, actually the math instructor, actually the tutors and all the students. And they're going, how do we tutor online? And I'm going, how do the students learn on tutoring online? Number one, Tell the tutor your learning preference, auditory visual, because if it's more auditory, you're gonna talk more. More visual, you're gonna draw like Fred said. Tell your tutor, what do you, when you get stuck, what do you do? Strategies, that's metacognitive. What are you gonna do? He had a bunch of resources. Hey, that's great. Show your tutor the problems. Oh boy, show it to him. Yeah, show him, pull him up, show him. Hold it up. Take pictures, screens, Screenshots, anything. Tell a tutor when you get stuck, okay? And basically talk out loud. Oh, this is good. This is what we do too. Have the students talk out loud how they solve the problem to the tutor. Also talk out loud to you. I can't read your stuff. Um, well, the last one is uh, show tutors your lecture or homework notes. Uh, I also have one there, show me your to-do list. That's with the management techniques. Uh, this is my to-do list. Isn't that neat? <clears throat> I like the one that's crossed out. I actually have students do the to-do list and show me the cross outs and that works too. So the last one is screen pictures. Um, you can do that screen dumps or just take your cell phone, take a picture of the screen, scan it in and send it to them. See, the tutoring part and the study skills part is pretty close. So what you want to do now is have them, and I'll do a quick review, have them take the math study skills evaluation and get some suggestions. Next one, deal with the anxiety issue because they definitely have it. I mean, <clears throat> no, 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 no joke. 
the, the note-taking is really good. Have them do it, because what happens when you start looking at tutoring, what we have to do is show tutors the lecture notes or your homework notes. You hold it up, because I can't tutor you unless I know what Fred's doing. If Fred shows you a different way, I'm gonna tutor that one. So your students have to be cognizant of doing that. And then also show the notes, so when you're talking to Fred, let's say, and you get stuck on a problem, the worst thing we wanna know is, I don't know what to do. I didn't get stuck. Where'd you get stuck? I don't know. Show me the problem and I can figure out where you got stuck. Then we can talk more. So I am moving down to nowhere land, which is this last slide. <laughs> this one with us working together and the questions. So we're going to open up the questions. Uh, Fred, you did an excellent job in this thing uh, and the resources. And the resources I have are, are good too. So why don't we open it up? Fred, you'll make a few comments first. Sure. Um, Jennifer uh, texted me some questions for the end, and uh, they seem to focus on two areas. The first is uh, grouping. How do you organize them? What's the technical uh, steps, strategies for grouping, et cetera? Um, I, 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 and I also read in the chat file that someone does different groups every class. Uh, someone, <clears throat> one of our attendees group students by major uh, or by day of week and time of day you're available. Uh, I don't know if there's any one great best way to do it. So I would just say experiment or ask the students. I'm, I'm, uh, I need to create groups for the class. How do you want to do it? Should we do it randomly? Or is there some other strategy? I, I would ask the class, how do you want to do it? In terms of my synchronous webinars, uh, Zoom assigns everyone to groups at random. So every class meeting, it's a different group at random. And I might take a quick look at it and it's easy to click and drag a student from one group to another. Um, I can also tell you that if students have not signed into Zoom through the app, they may not be allowed to join a breakout group. If they open up the meeting by, uh, through their browser, they might be left out of the groups the first time that happened to me, it was with three students. So I just met with them and we formed our own group. <laughs> so you just have to experiment and, and give it a try. Uh, the other topic Jennifer said the questions focused on was test proctoring. What software do you use? What issues have you had uh, with technical barriers and, in, and integrity of the exams? I've just kind of faced the fact that I cannot use any of my exams over again after this semester. They're gone. Uh, whether they're in my math lab or whether they're in Zoom, um, even though I'm watching students, it's so easy to cheat. I mean, I'll give you the example. I, I forget the, the name of the college, but there's Saracoso. It might be some school in Arizona that has tens of thousands of online students and their math department chair was giving an exam proctored online and he found out afterwards that out of camera range, the student had inserted a dongle into the USB port, which broadcast his screen to an accomplice in the parking lot who was <laughs> taking his, phone, his test on his laptop in the parking lot. <laughs> I mean, there are so many ways to cheat on, on online proctoring of exams. Yeah, you can cheat with a human proctor as well, um, but online, it just expands the possibilities for cheating. But I just can't focus on that right now. I've, I've done a complete mind shift. Um, electronic proctoring has added another barrier of stress mm -hmm. and technical difficulties to students. Not for everyone, but I just, I'm, I'm over it. I just, when this is all over on the other side of this pandemic, I plan to have our department return to paper and pencils exam proctored by humans. 
Yeah, another thing, Fred, too, you said you don't use your same test over again. Well, the ones you haven't used, like I said earlier about uh, preparing students, give them to them. I mean, that's what we did anyway in our math department. Old tests were, were on file. And it's a, a great diagnostic because what we try to do, and I didn't go through some other steps like the six types of test taking errors and things like that, when you get a test back to figure out if it's concept or if it's uh, misread directions or if it's careless. But if they can do that ahead of time, that's a great group project. And uh, I don't care if they get them right. You know, I care if they get them wrong, but it's a learning experience and that could be a group assignment. Because if you say, okay, we want your group to go here, here's the test, here's the previous test, talk about it, tell me the ones you have most difficult with, and they can share that with each other. That's the study skills strategy. That's good. Yeah. One complaint, not a complaint, but a fact of the matter is exams are typically limited to 20 questions. How do you cover an entire course that way? I often have a study guide or a review sheet mm -hmm. with maybe 40 questions. Mm -hmm. And I create that event in my mind thinking, if I could ask the class mm. to work 40 problems out for a final exam, what would they be? And that becomes a study guide. And I tell them I'm going to end up picking 20 of them to put on the test. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's another, another option. Fred and Paul, let me, let, me jump in for, let me jump in for a second. Um, we're, we're at about an hour, which was the advertised time. Um, I know some of you may not be able to stay much longer, but if Fred and Paul are willing to stay and answer some questions for those who can stay, um, I'll continue the recording. Um, but before we lose a lot of our audience because they have other obligations, if, if everyone could, uh, by way of the chat, thank Paul and Fred for their time and their ideas. And then if there are still more questions, I'll, I'll let Fred and Paul um, continue to answer questions until they're tired of answering questions. <laughs> and we will we'll record it for those who have to leave. So I just want to thank Fred and Paul for all their work, not just today, but what they've done over the years. I mean, these are two... Uh, Yay! <laughs> education. And so I'm, I'm glad we got to... So many people got to hear them today. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Pat, for organizing this. Yes, really. And I can see we, we have almost 100 participants still remaining. So, well, <laughs> like Pat said, I'm happy to stay here for longer. Yeah, so if, been some, else, if, been some... if you guys want to continue to answer questions, I'll, I'll allow you to do that. Um, I will send out an, an email um, following this with the recording, with the PowerPoints, and uh, with the link to the evaluation. So, thank you all for attending. And if you want to stay and hear some more, uh, answers uh, I'll let them continue yeah and also Fred and I we have more suggestions <laughs> so if, if we're waiting for the questions but for the next couple minutes I know I have a few more that I, I, we couldn't do I know Fred has a few more because we went through this pretty quickly but the whole point is to give you you motivation give you hope too just like with the mass study skills evaluation we give them hope to change their behaviors to make things more successful. Our point is to give you hope, and we have, both to help the students become better learners, and basically Fred in helping you become a better online instructor. I've learned a lot from him today. The main thing, what I could pick up real quick is, you gotta do groups. You, you gotta get them talking, because that reinforces the camaraderie. People leave because people don't think they care, right? And it, it's harder to leave a class if you have a group of people working together because the group will help you keep them together. So that's, that's my point. I'll have Fred talk about a couple of things if he wants, or we'll just take questions because okay. I know there's out there. There's, well, there's one question in the chat right now for you about, uh, do you find spending time on study skills and different types of learning help students be more successful in the math class? Uh, I have so much research on that, uh, including my PhD dissertation I did. Uh, if you get the person's name, I'll send you about 20 studies that have followed <laughs> that up. Plus, the research we did up front, because we went pretty fast through that because we had to get to the content. It, it's the same thing. Zentech says 42% of the grade is affective. Yes. Um, actually, Julie Phelps and Zentech again, 38% is the variance of the grade is self-equity. So this is what's happening now. The, the shift is shifted. 
It's been shifting all along to the making the student a better learner. Now it's really shifted because we are great instructors. However, based on research, we only got 25% of the variance of the grade, but we're already doing 24 and a half. Now we're doing better with Fred stuff. So the switch is going. So I'd rather do more study skills in the classroom, knowing that they're gonna study more outside and learn it outside and give them strategies. Then do you add to what Paul said, students yeah. often learn better and more from each other than yes. they do from you. Oh, yes. So you can do things like uh, at the beginning, sometime during the class, ask for input. What, what's a study technique or strategy mm -hmm. that's been successful for you in the past and share it? I've also talked to professors who mm -hmm. at the end of the semester write down, please write a letter to students next semester and share mm -hmm. strategies that you would advise them to use. And, and then you share those the next semester with, that means a lot more than sometimes than something coming from you as a professor. You're not kidding me. In <laughs> fact, I had students use this in math classes and they come to me and say, you know, I use some of those techniques. Well, well which one did you use? The anxiety reduction and the note taking. Did it improve your grade? Uh, yes, it did. Would you like to share that with the class? And every time they say yes, and that's what, then I just sit back there and let them talk. Also with the math study skills evaluation, you can make that as assignment, you can make that as discussion, you can make it as discussion with, not even with you there, extra chats. But the short answer is, we gotta make them better learners, otherwise it's gonna lose them. The next question I'm gonna get into, and this needs some responses, because what I'm getting is, what can we do with the repeaters? They had it. They failed, now what are we gonna do with them? And the instruction that Fred talked about will definitely increase their learning. But what I'm saying is now they really have a motivational issue. They already failed once. So now we gotta bring in the study skills and teach at least the note taking, the anxiety. You know, I have some other ones in there too that really will help them. And they can go, oh, I'm doing something different. I'm successful. We don't want them to get into the learn helpless mode of basically it didn't work. If I do it again, it won't work. So this time I'm not even going to try that much because if I try and fail, it hurts worse. I just don't try and fail. I don't feel that bad. So yeah, it, it does work. I'll be glad to share more if that person wants to know. I saw a great question about how do you get faculty to join you? Ah. And shifting the emphasis uh, from cheating to, to learning. Yeah, um, that's, that's think, a tough one. I mean, I I, if you, in my talk, slide number 19 referenced an inside higher ed article, talked about the need to focus on humane and meaningful student learning experiences. Mm -hmm. And that article would be a big help. Gosh, there was something else that I saw. Um, uh, I'll, I'll post it. Um, I'll find it. I'll post it. Okay, so Fred, while you're looking for that, one question specific to your talk that was in the webinar is, do you require students to watch some videos or to read something before they come to your synchronous class sessions? <laughs> I've tried that. It was a failure. <laughs> um, it's kind of like the flip learning dilemma. When you flip the learning, most students don't come to class having done the outside mm -hmm. activities. And I know there are ways to make them do it, you know, embed quiz questions in the videos and give them a quiz when they walk in the door. I, I've just, I'm just not comfortable being a policeman like that. And instead, no, I, might, anxiety too. <laughs> so. yeah, I might refer them, I might refer them instead to supplemental material uh, during a yes. class rather than, ref, rather than force them to watch something before class. Mm -hmm. That technique has just never worked for me personally. <clears throat> Another thing I've done too, and Fred's already done this, uh, apps. Well, I'll put it up there. I tell them all about apps. 
you know, all these apps on here, you know, uh, Allegro, Algebra Tutor, um, Photo Math, et cetera, et cetera. The other app you were talking about, let's see here. Yeah, the CS one here, that's a, that's a cam scanner. Is that what you're talking about, Fred? Where I can actually take a picture of any anything and convert it right into a Word file and send it right to, I mean, just even, I don't even, I convert it and I just email it directly to you. This is all with the cam scanner. I think I pay five bucks a month for this one. Yeah, so, cam scanner is what I use and I yeah, have, a, that's I what have I thought. a video. I have a link to a video in my presentation that shows them how to create a multi-page PDF file and email it to me. And it's free, it works with, I, it works with iOS and uh, Windows. Um, and PDF is the best format, much better than anything else. It and works. it's free. There is a pro version, and every time you open it up, you'll get prompted to convert. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not needed. Well, we did that, too, with some of the study skills. And we actually had put study skills questions on tests. I mean, on them. And um, I tell them, we're going to put a study skills question. Here's 10 questions. See, this, I'm doing the same thing he did. He has, like, 20 questions. We're going to pick several. We do the same thing. We put up about 15 questions on study skills. I'm gonna pick two and put on a test. And it's gonna be pretty much um, not a multiple choice. It's gonna be an open format. One would be what relaxation technique do you use and how often you do it? Another one is I want you to listen, describe your note-taking system and draw me a picture. Now, when I'm doing that, I realize if, if, that they all will learn it. Most of them will learn it. And they will automatically get three points, maybe five points on a test. I've also had instructors going, oh, my goodness, you're giving away the test. They're, they're going to not do well on the test and, and use your study skills and pass and fail the next course. And I'm going, how good are you at statistics? And they go, what do you mean? This is five points on one test. So they got a 50 average. Now they got a 55. They still failed. They're still not going on, but they learn new strategies. So that's a technique I've used too, just to help them understand. And that works because now you can do it as groups. And now they can just tell me what, you know, questions and I'll post them and go, I'm going to pick a few. And I only do that. Most of the study skills, what we're doing is up to midterm. What we found out too, that if we up front load the study skills, make some better learners in in the classroom with note taking, especially online, because I had so many people, and I'm just going to reiterate this again, that I asked them, what did you study for the test? And they go, well, nothing. I got them all right on my math lab or Hawks or, or um, a web assign. I'm going, good. You got a good short-term memory. Problem is, during test time, we ain't testing short-term memory. We're testing long-term memory and abstract reasoning. So what did you review? Oh, nothing. I said, hmm. What do you think you should do next time? Oh, review. I said, yeah, but what are you going to review? Well, okay, I'm going to use your note-taking system. I said, yeah, use that or make a modification of that because those you can actually use that note-taking system to predict test questions too. So now they have something to review. And again, I talked about them showing it to people, showing it to other people. So that is also active learning like Fred was talking about, actively writing it down, actively reviewing it. So um, I'm on my soapbox now. But I know that works because people have used it and they went back to me and said, oh, yeah, I passed the test before it was on the tip of my tongue, but I couldn't get it out. I said, well, yeah, because it's like playing football. If you haven't practiced the plays for a while and we go tell you to do the play, you don't know what to do. You're hesitate. Now you practice ahead of time. As soon as you get it, you go right to it and do it. Okay, Fred, I talk much, a lot. You're up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I think I... I think I found, I mean, there are so many uh, articles that I've come across um, about how not to emphasize cheating. And I found one article, if you'll just Google inside, inside higher ed, Big Proctor. Okay, I'll repeat that. Google inside higher ed 
big proctor. And the byline is, is the fight against cheating during remote instruction worth enlisting third party student surveillance platforms? And that, this article actually focuses on how the, the, the electronic surveillance vendors are manipulating the marketplace to convince you ah, to buy into their platform. They're scaring you. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> that's one article, um, but that's not the best one. I'll keep, I'll keep looking. I'll keep trying to find the best one. Yeah, another thing you can do, too, we, we've done at our college for years, and even if it's online, you can still do this. The first day of class or after that, you give them an assessment. Man, you can use an electronic assessment. Uh, we've actually used old pencil paper assessments from you know, the previous final exams. And we give it to the students and we will assess them. Now, does that mean we move them up or down? Yeah, probably not. But what it tells me immediately, if I give you a 20 question assessment, if you're in college algebra, I give you a 20 question assessment of intermediate. You know, not the hard stuff, but the basic stuff. And uh, actually, you score it. And most people are honest. I'll say, this doesn't count as a grade. It's this helps me figure out what's going on. And if you got them all right, I ain't worried about you. If you got three right, got that three right out of the prerequisites, I'm worried about you. Then I can say, OK, we need to give you some supplemental material, like Fred was talking about earlier, to catch you up. Because we know math is linear. And if you don't get to the background back here, we're gonna have problems here. And then uh, what it does, it alerts me too in the fact that, okay, this person is, person is not really up to par. I better check on him or her more often. And then when they take the first test and make a, a, a 75 on it, I'm going, okay, that's good. Now they take the first test and make a 35 on it. Then I know, and I hate to say this, I know, it's not me, <laughs> okay? I, I feel bad when they don't do well. But if I know that they came in with unprepared skills and they, quote, cheated their way through the last course, and I, I'll never accuse them of that because you, you got to have two people watch somebody cheating to call it because I used to be an institutional test administrator, dealt with this. Um, so the idea is I can go, okay, they're not doing well. Let's give them some help now help now. So we need more help in tutoring. We need, need more help in some beginning materials, et cetera, et cetera. So to ease some of the faculty's mind, uh, you're going to catch them. <laughs> okay. It may be the next course, you know, and then we can start helping them again. So what do you think about that, Fred? You, you ever thought of those? Yeah. Um, I was I was referencing one of my mentors, Michelle Patansky Brock, who has a great tweet. Now uh, you can't mm -hmm. see that. She says, "Trust your students, support their learning, don't mm -hmm. judge them. Mm -hmm. If you're focused on catching cheating, that's the sign of a problem with your course. So redesign your assessments oh. with the assumption that students have the internet in their pocket." Yeah. So, <laughs> But that's easier said than done, like I've said. I, I have to admit my exams are fairly traditional, but mm -hmm. I, would, I would love to include questions like the ones I posted at the, at the mm -hmm. end of my talk. So um, Fred, you had a, a question uh, with a detail from, uh, I don't know if he's still in the session, Daniel Vaccaro, but he asked it again. Uh, so you, a student misses a synchronous session and you require them to watch the recording, what do you ask the student to turn in to prove that they've watched the video? Yeah, I ask for a summary of what happened, mm -hmm. with some comments and feedback. That's it, pretty simple. A summary of the class mm -hmm. and some comments and feedback. So it's pretty open-ended. Okay, I believe you've already answered this question, but there's one about the FERPA issues surrounding recorded videos. Did, uh, it says, do you require students to sign a waiver? Nope, I don't. I, I think 
I've heard that as long as you announce the meetings being recorded, mm -hmm. which I do verbally myself, plus when I click on the record button, Zoom, a Zoom audio alert also says the meeting's being recorded. And if you stay in the meeting, that, that, uh, that implies consent. And so I think that'll handle that. One last technical question is what stylus do you use? <laughs> Uh, this is probably 15 years old. It came with my uh, motion computing tablet, which is a company that's gone out of business. <laughs> but uh, every tablet PC comes with one. Here's one I just pulled out of the holding slot in my Fujitsu. So every tablet PC comes with their own stylus. Um, I like the ones like these two that don't require batteries. I hate that. My HP tablet PC requires a battery, and it's problematic. Mm. But whichever device you use, it will come with a stylus or two. But the tablet PC changed my life. I love it because um, I, I can set it on the podium and I face the class. I can bring in screen captures from the internet, uh, pages from the ebook. You know, I don't have to any longer write out complicated word problems. Um, I just snag it and paste it right into the lecture notes. I use color. You saw some examples. Yes, that's good. I use colored ink, I use highlighters. And I also use it as a consensus building component of the class. Every few minutes, I'll pause and I'll ask the class, how's that look? If you, if you open up these notes tomorrow or a week from now, will you remember what we were talking about? Any suggestions? And they'll go, oh yeah, Professor Cohn, could you, could you put a draw a red circle around this? Or could you change that color? Or could you put a flag by that? So it's a, when we take, notes together it's a consensus building activity and uh, when I was using the tablet PC in class I noticed that about half the students stopped taking notes and they were focusing more on the content uh, because they know that I'm taking notes for them before I leave the room they get posted to the course website so any, anyone who is absent or one that wants access to those notes has immediate access to them so it's, it's been a tablet PC with digital ink has changed my life. You know, it cost a couple thousand dollars, but hey, this is your profession. You want the best equipment and tools and resources. Even if the school won't buy them, reach into your own pocket. It's worth it. Tax tablet deductible. PC should last <laughs> five or six years. So what's, you know, a $2,000 investment spread over six years totally worth it yeah you're also doing active learning you involve them which increases their attention which increases their learning that's great now they yeah, got something also to invite over. students to the podium and they take the pen and they write oh really easy that's great so they come up to the podium you know i call on a student at random and mm -hmm. they come up to the podium and write of course that's in the classroom right uh, when we're online I will, I will uh, pose a, a question and ask students, like I said earlier, to hold up, hold up uh -huh. their work to the webcam so that we can all see it. Low-tech solution <laughs> to a high-tech problem. <laughs> but I'm telling you, it, that changed my life. Be, two years ago, when I started teaching remote classes in Zoom, I reached out to all my AMATIC colleagues all over the country and everyone else I knew. How do students communicate mathematically to each other in a remote you know, Zoom webinar? And nobody knew. They said, oh, use the mouse, use the Zoom whiteboard. Well, you know, that's shit. Mm -hmm. That's crap. <laughs> so I came up with it by my, my, myself. I got a piece of scratch paper and I took a thick Sharpie and I wrote on it. And, held it up to the webcam and everybody could see it. Yeah. So that, that changed my life, little things like that. I see and, uh, one more technical question from uh, Diana Ramsar. 
Do you use OneNote? I actually use the predecessor to OneNote called Journal. I don't even know if it's available anymore. <clears throat> OneNote is like a big filing cabinet with all kinds of features and capabilities. Journal is just like an electronic pad of paper. It's much simpler and easier to, easier to use, but either one is fine. Anything, whatever comes with your tablet PC is what you should use. You're welcome, Chloe. <laughs> um, I become pretty adept at multitasking during a webinar. You know, I have my electronic paper open. I have my internet browser open. I have Wolfram Alpha open. I have Desmos open. I have the ebook open. I mean, I've got probably six or eight tabs that I can bounce back and forth between and do screen captures and post into the notes and annotate on top of. It's just, whew, it's so amazing. It's so much better than paper and pencil or a whiteboard and a marker. Mm. You can resize, you can move around. Here's what I did once, check this out. Uh, graphing linear, a system of linear inequalities. That's a multi-step process, right? So here's what, I, here's what you can do. You can start out by graphing one equation, and then you copy that and move it to the side, and then you add the other equation to that, that's the other boundary line, copy that and move it to the side, and then you start shading in one side of the line or the other and moving that to the side, and then you shade in the overlapping region and move that to the side. It's all digital. So in the end, though, you've got six steps that show the students one by one, little pictures, wow. step by step of what you did. You can't do that on a whiteboard. You can't do no. that on paper and pencil or a chalkboard. <laughs> it's very cool. Um, the most current question is, what about accessibility? Yeah, that's huge. And unfortunately, and luckily, <clears throat> We have a, a vice president who has some sympathy with STEM classes. Because the notation is so difficult, we're not really being scrutinized by a, mic by a magnifying glass or a microscope. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's huge. And unfortunately, there's a lot of pictures and diagrams that are just not accessible. I mean, there are ways around it. I went to an AMATIC presentation where a trigonometry professor had a blind student in class. And what she did was invite the student down the hall to her, to her office after every class with a cork board and some pipe cleaners. Mm -hmm. You know what pipe cleaners are? Mm -hmm. Those fuzzy, mm -hmm. twisty things. So she would lay out the, the pipe cleaners, the fuzzy, twisty things on the cork board and have the student run their fingers over it to get a feel for the shape of grass. But dude, guess what? TI calculators have an audio interface that you can snap onto them, extra cost. And Desmos, Desmos yes. has a blind uh, feature that allows pitches as a graph increases and decreases and beeps that annotate special uh, uh, points on the graph, like intercepts and, and inflection points and maximum and minimum. So students can, is, <laughs> there are so many cool things. So investigate that. Investigate desmos.com for blind students or TI calculators for blind students. There are some brand new tools available. That's the great. hardest thing is like Paul and I have talked about students using mobile scanning apps to take pictures of their work and post it. You can't, those aren't accessible. Um, you know what else, you know what is accessible though, are the math templates that are part of your course website. Um, or I, I don't know if, if Mathematica is, but if, if you're using a math template, those are typically accessible. So I can tell students when you post your work in the body of a discussion board message, use the built-in template because that's accessible. But if you scan and insert a picture, of course, that's not. 
um, in terms, back to Pearson in my math lab, almost every exercise uh, it has an icon next to it that says this is readable by a screen reader. Mm -hmm. And you just choose those exercises to mm -hmm. assign. It's about 99% of the questions. But I just make sure when I create homework and quizzes to only assign those problems that are accessible. But I, I know, I know there are lawyers who are skimming, you know, the, the internet and, 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 and what's it, what's it called? An ambulance chaser, like the lawyers who chase ambulances. I know there are lawyers out there who are chasing after students with disabilities who are willing to participate in a lawsuit activity. And you're screwed if that happens. I mean, it's, it, it's very tough. It, it's a very tough world out there. And, 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 I, and I know that often professors respond by saying, well, if I have, know I have an, a disabled student in my class, I will accommodate that person. And the response is, you shouldn't have to ask. They shouldn't have to tell you. Your course should be accessible automatically for everyone. It's, it's a very tough world out there. Good luck with that. Just, I maintain a very close relationship with our special programs. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the person who heads up the disabilities and special programs uh, department at our college, she and I are buddies. I mean, I, we talk all the time about students and as a department chair, I discuss mm -hmm. problematic situations with other math faculty and other math classes. So we've built up a trust. So I, re I recommend that. Look at your special services and disabilities program, not as an adversary, but as an accomplice and collaborate closely with them. And hopefully they're a human being and they'll understand the difficulties of the notation in the math courses that we face. That's the best advice I can give. Yeah, also, I've been very lucky I, nothing's happened. <laughs> I worked in that area several times. And one of the better things, too, is, is have some of the disability coordinator people, you know, coordinators, staff, et cetera, and a group of math instructors to get together to make some plans. You know, what do we do this case, this case, this case before it happens? I worked with one college, uh, and they called me in because they said, we know we have to. For some disabilities, you have to give uh, FOLO sheets, okay? And I'm not really worried about that, honestly. You know, if, if they got the formula and can't, don't know how to use it, they're still gonna fail the question, okay? But some of the people had trouble recalling the formulas. So they actually got together and decided what they would do for different courses, and it was all set up, and everybody was, I gotta say, happy? Because now they had an idea what to do, and it was consistent with, with the Office of Civil Rights, what they're gonna get you on is inconsistency within your own college. So Fred, what you're doing is right. You're the math chair. You're sorry setting up the consistency, what they're doing and the, and the, the talking. So I think, I think you're pretty well safe, honestly. Yeah, you're I'll give you another it. example. In, in class, this was not online, but in class I had a visually impaired student and you know how I was discussing that I, that I project my tablet PC up onto the screen. Mm -hmm. And those notes I save to a PDF file and post before I leave the class. And that student was saying she, she got around her visual impairment by enlarging that PDF file. Yeah, she's a partial, yeah. Yes, but the yeah. disabilities coordinator told me that's unacceptable because she can't see it at the same time the rest uh, of the class is. So yeah. I said, so that's, what the hell am I going to do? She's great. You better <laughs> I'll help you. I will find a way yeah. for her well, to stream that projection uh, on, on an iPad in front of her that she can view and enlarge in real time. Yeah, and it, the two of us plus our IT staff worked yeah. for several weeks trying to make that happen. We just never could. So we gave up. She said, we'll have to settle for the fact that when she gets home, she can enlarge the PDF file and read your notes. Yeah, you can good. also coordinate it with a tutor. Uh, yeah. And what, what you're doing is what we call a good faith effort. Yeah. And good faith efforts, you're not going to get dinged for those. It's when yeah. you just totally ignore everything. So now we're off in a different tension. <laughs> but it, is, it has come up to some yeah, of my colleagues. It's huge. You know. it's huge. Yeah, it has. And, 
and I think what you're doing, some of the suggestions and what I have is the same, is the same thing. Uh, even when we get into the instead of tutors, you know, I kind of touched on academic coaches. They're the ones that will teach the students how to study and learn. I've also had people in Calc 2 and 3 that were totals, okay? And uh, trigonometry, we use pegboards for string, which is similar to what you're doing. And I also had them immediately work with a tutor that was paid by the math department. You got that? And to go over and do tracing, I actually use glue sometimes to do the bell curve when we're doing statistics. So the, it's, it's doable. A lot of times it's not doable in the classroom, but what you did is set up where it's doable outside so the content is still being received. And during that's, the Zoom class meetings, during the remote classes, not yes. only does Zoom record, but yeah. it transcribes pretty accurately everything yes. you and your students mm -hmm. say, mm -hmm. uh, and, it, and it syncs it up with the video. Mm -hmm. And when you open it up, you can access it and edit it Perfect. and save it very easily. So every class meeting, I open up that recording, and I spend maybe five minutes quickly looking through mm -hmm. the transcription and making a few changes for improvement. But uh, students, if they have a hearing problem, they can read that transcription right. in real time with the video. You're really the chat good, file though. is also saved. <laughs> so everything students type into the chat file is also saved. And that's uh, available and accessible as well. Right. So Zoom does a pretty good job. Mm -hmm. Of handling students with disabilities. Yeah, I you actually got Jennifer? Zoom myself. I bought it for me, uh, the the web version, and it does all everything you said. It's it's really good. So, any more questions on learning? I know there's probably a few people still in there, so we're going to give you the notice. <laughs> okay, um, Fred and I can talk forever, uh, honestly, and, and Jennifer can kick in more questions. I know she has them on her mind. But the, this webinar is for you. So, you know, and, and I, like I do when I do my presentations, if you ask a question, how can I say this? Some people want to ask questions that they don't want anybody to know about. So if you want to send in a question and put to me or Fred, I think Jennifer can send it to us and we'll still answer it. If you have other questions, if they, if they get an email to me, I, I will answer them. And, and the idea yeah, I have a I, I have a follow-up action item. <laughs> okay. There was one slide I showed that was uh, my sources of non-routine uh, uh, questions that stimulate discussion, and I have a link for it, and it opens up in screencast.com, which requires Flash, and Flash is kind oh. of being phased out. And Jennifer was saying when she tried to follow the link, it didn't work. I'm, I'm not sure what to do. Jennifer, do you have any ideas? I mean, I, how can I take a PowerPoint slide and capture it and post it online? Do you, what, what tool do you use or what would you guys suggest? Anybody? Toby? Um. I have my pen in hand. I'm ready to jot down if you have any hot <laughs> tips on how to take a file and put it into the cloud for everyone to see. There are a couple of suggestions in the comments. Okay, and save the slide as a PDF, then what do you do with it? Il Ilvana said, save the slide as a PDF, then what do you do with that PDF? I think I would just retype the list in Word with all the links and then send it out as a Word document then that way everyone's got all the live links in one easily accessible place. It does require a slight, you know, transfer, but, um, oh, and, and you're saying don't retype it, you can paste it from PowerPoint. Yeah, and, yeah, and I, I, I understand how to do that. I understand how, to, how I can save anything as a PDF, but then how do I, she says, post it anywhere. How so? How do I do that? How do I post it? I don't want to post a link. I want to, oh, you're right. How do I post that link? So, all right, well, I've got to run. So that thank link, you all it, for it'll be a, That link will be a URL. You're right, the link will be a URL.
That's what I tried to do. <laughs> okay, okay, I know, you're right. There is a way to post a PDF file, a URL, without it being part of a web, a hosting website like Screencast or, or uh, Bucket, or et cetera. You're right. Post the link as a PDF file on, okay, I can do it. Thanks, Ilva. I think I got it. Okay. <laughs> I'm still on the webinar. That was my wife just came in. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go ahead and sign out. Okay. Pat, Thanks, any Pat. Words? Thanks, Paul. It was a pleasure yes. working with you. Okay. We'll Take do care. it again. We'll be in touch. Okay. Hopefully, you can be at the Matic conference, right? Yeah, I hope it's on. I'll be there. The last What's I heard, it, it, it was yes. Good. Good. The last I heard. So anyway. What have you heard, Pat? It's supposed to still be on. Okay, awesome. Uh, Fred, right. Paul, if you could send me your PowerPoints. A lot of people were asking about those to, to send out. Um, I will. I will send it immediately. Please do, because I want to get the recording out uh, later today if I can. Okie doke. So the recording, this is a technical, the recording you're sending out doesn't include the PowerPoints already? No, it's just a, re well, but some people want to have the PowerPoints also, so they can oh, click okay. Got it. Okay, that's all like that. before they just everything was together and they right, were but, but, they, but the links okay. are be active in the recording. Sounds good to me. Thank you, Pat. Okay, thanks guys, and Thank thanks you, to Pat. everybody that attended. Okay, bye bye.